one rhyme at a time. Unpacking the meaning and the muse with the Poetic Diva is podcast programming that reminds us of the connection between poetry and mental and emotional wellness. This program has been brought to you by Rhyme and Chat Interactive Poetry Organization and the financial and technical support of the Lindhurst Foundation, Arts Build, Amplify, First Property Management, and our Chattanooga local NPR station, WUTC 88.1. So, whether you're a poetry enthusiast or simply someone seeking inspiration and understanding, join us as we unravel the threads of creativity and introspection, one rhyme at a time. Welcome to the conversation. So welcome to One Rhyme at a Time podcast, where poetry meets mental wellness, right here in the heart of Chattanooga, Tennessee. I am the Poetic Diva, and I am honored to be with you on this poetic journey. In every episode, we are being visited by a poet and a mental health professional. And in this episode, we will be talking about anxiety. Our poet today, Nalanjan Patry. Nalanjan Patry has worked in the energy industry for over 25 years. His passion in the technology sphere to understand the needs and develop business solutions, leveraging the right technology is his sweet spot. He works at TVA and has been blessed working with a team of wonderful individuals who have been instrumental in making him a better person. In his spare time, Nalanjan plays badminton, table tennis, and immerses himself in writing poetry. His poetry topics are based on social issues, personal interactions with others, and themes drawn from paintings, sculptures, and other art forms. It is with the help of those who have been in his life, conjured magical moments, borne the hurt, felt the oppression, and opposed the unjust, that he draws inspiration to write freely. Mental health, how it has been stigmatized and is currently being handled, has been one of the important subjects in his poetry. So let's listen in as Nalanjan shares his poem, My Time Box, with us today. My Time Box. With its controlled hands, time moved, grazing the edges of the timepiece. I was trying to fall in step with time that had me disrupted. Desperate to make it my internal clock, I tried to force my heartbeat to be in rhythm. With a ticking of each sound, trying not to miss a beat. It has been a long time paying the price with each step since I acquiesced with the time honored tradition of following you. I would like to be free from my self-created time box, where anxiety knows no time, choosing to intrude my being at will. I have felt violated by its arrogance, leveraging my obsession with acceptance, a weakness wanting to be in lockstep with a world that refused my personality. It did not work to stay on this new course. These intrusions into my being took me twisting and exhausted to a new state of misery. Driven back to relive my personality from the doldrums of rejection, I realize it's my nature to be happy by being me on my own time. That's amazing. So my time box, give us a little bit of information about what made you choose this title for this poem. One of the things that I have found quite a few of my friends who deal with these issues struggling is with time. They're very anxious. They're very anxious because of two things. For them, anxiety brings to four, two words, grating and explode. Hmm. So when you say creating, it's like, I, I just want to be someone I'm not because the world is not accepting me the way I am. And 
Now, as they try to follow the time, the way society expects them to behave, it's like they are boxed into some into a personality that they can't freely express themselves. And, and putting time in a box shows the the restraints and the constriction of it. I was really, really impressed with a lot of your word choice because it draws such a clear picture of of what you're communicating, which is the the anxiousness and a lot. In a lot of cases, it's self-inflicted. It's like we put that on ourselves. And it was very, very clear. Some of the, the lines that stand out to me is when you use controlled hands. That put me in the mind of it being steady. And it's unfazed by us. It doesn't care about us, what we're doing, what we've got going on. It is controlled and planned. And then when you say fall in step, my mind went to double dutch and like jump roping and how there's you know people that are that are turning the rope and then you're like trying to find the rhythm so that you can jump in without causing any type of disruption and things like that so take us on on a little journey and explain to us some of your thought process as you were creating this poem and the word selection that you finally landed on just take that example with two folks trying to move the rope and a person trying to make sure they are stepping into it correctly. The problem we have is the pace at which the rope moves and the pace at which the person moves may be two different things. And the reason as to why someone likes to keep pace with societal edicts may be because in some cases they're not accepted for who they are or they are trying to fight something where they can't find support with. So what do you do next? When you are unsupported, all you try to do is, let me try to be somebody so that I can be accepted by my friends. Let me be somebody whom I can be accepted where I can get help. Because you don't want to stand out with an issue because there is, there are in, in some cases where talking about mental health issues, talking about anxiety, talking about any other health issues you have, especially mental health issues, is stigmatized. And that's the reason when, when you give the introduction of uh, these things being stigmatized, it leads people to kind of shy away from accepting the fact that I have a problem that needs to be addressed and therefore I need help. Because if you put that on your resume, you're not going to go very far. It's true. It's so true. You, you try to cover it up. And unfortunately, most of these, um, I, I would say, very hard conversations you're having internally is because you're trying to be somebody you're not. Uh, and I, I think the my, my main, um, I would say, drive in terms of, you know, what I'm trying, the essence of the poem is that sentence. Um, it's a weakness, wanting to be in lockstep with a world that refused my personality. You say, I try to force my heartbeat to be in rhythm. Unpack that line for us. So, so you know, in terms of music, right? I mean, if you listen to music, there are certain beats that you love and certain beats you say, great, it's not for me. But when the society beats in only a certain way and you listen to it and you say, that's not who I am, but if I'm not falling in line with that beat, I'm not with everybody else. I'll be alone. Right. And that's why I'm getting anxious, because I'm alone. I want to be with others. Right. Unfortunately, the solution creates additional anxiety rather than reducing the root cause of why you're unhappy. Sounds like that, in that particular case, it's kind of like a lie that we tell ourselves. Because in a lot of cases, the people around us, they're they really just want us to be ourselves. They want us to be who we are. And they will accept our genuineness, our walking and living in our truth. But yet we we hide behind a mask. And we hide behind and we try to conform and we try to but but when you think back, 
to like the people who have been the most impactful in your life, the people who you enjoy being around the most, they are the people who are a little offbeat, a little quirky, a little, you know, different from everybody else, not doing the normal thing. But we, we tend to lie to ourselves and think that in order to be accepted, we have to conform. Exactly. And, and that's what, that's one of the things that interesting you point that out because I read this poem to one of the, one of my friends who was, who was struggling with this. And I said, what would be your closing sentence? And we, we talked about this for some time. I mean, the closing sentence in this poem is, I realize it's in my nature to be happy by being me on my own time. It is interesting as we talked, we tried to reframe the ending of this poem from his perspective and we landed up on a sentence which I thought was even more powerful than my ending and what we landed up was I swear to find happiness in time so it is now time is secondary happiness is primary so I like that we do have somebody from our audience who has said I love the poem And the phrase, I would like to be free. And they want to know, what was your journey in finding freedom? And they also want to know, do you have any suggestions to others in achieving that form of freedom? So the first freedom is, in my case, uh, personally, it's a freedom to write on topics that have not been written. Uh, Mm -hmm. And this happens to be a very quote-unquote taboo topic. I mean, writing on mental health. Because the first thing, when you write a poem like this, the first question people ask is, so do you have an issue? Yeah, and, and that's fine. I mean, I'm I'm anxious on certain things too. It's not that, you know, we. I feel that all of us are on the spectrum somewhere. Some having less, some having more. But we are all on the spectrum. I mean, there is no person living their life without being on the spectrum of anxiety, mental health issues. We all face it. Uh, so, I mean, in my in my case, the freedom comes from being able to freely express myself through poetry so that I'm able to share not only my pain, I'm able to write words that tells me the pain other people are going to. Mm-hmm. And obviously writing a poem and keeping it in my journal, that's not really serve the purpose. When you have forums like what Rhyme and Chat provide, now then you reach out to people and say, okay, this is what people face. This is how we deal with it. And we have a professional talking about it. We feel even more empowered that, okay, you know what? Let me ask her this question. And and that's the way I seek freedom. I seek freedom through words. I seek freedom through the fact that we have a conversation. And what I would recommend for people who want the same freedom is your freedom may not be freedom you want through words. It may be through art. It may be through other expressions that you have in your life, which are more meaningful to you as a person. Uh, I mean, words is just one figure of a uh, one form of expression, but there could be dances, there could be so many other things you could do, and I, I would, I would leave it up to you. Make it personal. You have to make freedom personal. Find your freedom. Exactly. Yeah, seek it out. Mm-hmm. And and it seems like it also takes a concerted and intentional effort to do that. Do Ex- that exactly, exactly. And I, I, I mean, when people point it out, I think very often we try to explain words in the way that we have heard others talk to us about. When you write a poem, you are expressing from within your heart what your definition of certain words like freedom, anxiety, happiness is. And I think that gives you the um, the privilege of telling other people, this is what it means to me. Okay. But I think, I think it's a privilege to even hear somebody talk about freedom and what it means to them. I agree with that. I agree with that. Another person in our audience mentions the line, since I acquiesced with the time-honored tradition of following you. And they're wanting to they're wanting to know, could your want to fit into others' expectations stem from needing to follow family traditions? Absolutely, I th- I think that's that where that's where it all starts. I think it's it's a question of uh, when we are brought up in a structure, and then we have the freedom of choosing a different route. The first thing that hits us is I'm not being normal because this is not what I have been taught. 
we don't think that as we grow older, there are new learnings that all of us learn. We learn about people. We learn about other cultures. We learn about how other people exist, how they find happiness in things we may not even have considered. And then a door opens and we say, you know what? I think that will be something that I can find happiness in, but that's not something that my culture has endorsed. So it's a choice we make. It's a choice we make at that point in time where are you living for someone else or are you living for yourself? Oh, and it's that's a question. A yes. I mean, in, in some cases when we in, in like when we're young or in certain certain times in our life, we may be living for other people. That's just the fact of life. But there'll be a time when you come at crossroads and then you choose that other road that has not that has not been traveled because your culture is different. And then you'd realize I, I have realized that when you travel on that road, there will be friction, but then you'll find happiness in facing that friction and talking about it and that people know who you are and who you are for a reason. And that within itself can bring on quite a bit of anxiety. Yes, it does. It does. <laughs> having to traverse. Yes, traverse, <laughs> traverse that, that path. Exactly, exactly. Realizing that anxiety is really just a part of existing what was it that prompted you to write the poem? So I think the fact that we all have some level of anxiety, sometimes we don't consider it as a thing. We just shove it under the carpet and we say that, no, 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 that's because I had something bad to eat and therefore I'm just a bit breathless. I was breathless in certain instances and that was classic anxiety. Mm. It is not something I ate two days ago or a day ago. So I, I think the fact that just like when you get a cut, you apply the medication, you put a Band-Aid, and you are, I'm waiting for it to heal. I think anxiety has to read the same way. Mm. You have to understand the root cause, how you can help reduce your anxiousness as you move forward. So let's not push it on the carpet, the reason as to why we are anxious, and, and try to remove that reason so that we are happier. What was your process of capturing a portrait of anxiety and then putting it into words? Yeah, so I put myself in the shoes of the people I talked to. I said, okay, now I'm in your shoes. You're a person who is X. You're a person who is in this environment. You're a person who is fighting against these specific relics that are come out of your past or these things that are coming out of your present. How would I behave in your shoes? And as luck would have it, once you put yourself in that mindset, you are just like them. So it made it easier for me to translate that into words and put it down. Because at the end of the day, I think you should be open to other people's experiences. And once you're able to appreciate where they're coming from instead of being judgmental, I think it really helps to understand how you as a person can not only help others, but understand and try to empathize as to what the other person is going through. So this is a personal question mm -hmm. about you. So this particular listener is wanting to know how you make the most of your time when you are not working in your career field, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. A um, couple of things. Number one, I think when you're not working, uh, it's important to realize that every person needs their own safe zones. So create a safe zone. And for me, the safe zone is sitting in a room, either listening to some music, writing a few words down, trying to understand, read a biography, trying to understand how somebody else's life has been, and try to learn from it. The other piece of it is, Stress is unavoidable in your job. So what's your outlet for stress? For me, the outlet for stress is badminton table tennis going to the gym. So I think it's important for us as we kind of mold our life in whatever age group we fall in, it's important to address issues related to what's your comfort zone, what's your space that you're comfortable in, what's your stress relievers, what levers are going to pull to reduce your stress. and then. What are the areas you find happiness in? Because you can't be happy all the time, and that's a given. You, there are issues that you're going to face. But with the other two as kind of things that you can use, try to be happy. And I think that's the key. Being intentional. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful.
Yeah. Yeah. So there's some other parts of the poem that stood out to me. I'm seeing different parts that refer to feelings of being disrespected, disregarded, and rejection. Mm -hmm. And as I'm reading through all of it, I, I have felt violated by its arrogance. And it is referring to time. That's great. So <laughs> just the fact that, that it's per being personified, that it's <laughs> taking on yeah. like a person yes. and those characteristics, I think that is really, really artfully done. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, what are some of your favorite parts of the the poem that you created here? Yeah, I, I think that what you just, just now stated, I think that's one of my uh, favorite parts in terms because I think when you're anxious and I felt it, I've been anxious in a lot of a lot of it I mean in, in a lot of instances. For example, uh when you're coming for the first time when you're coming to the United States from India, uh you land in we land in Atlanta, uh, and then I not have simple things. I don't have a car. I don't have a credit card. We had to walk to the nearest Walmart. And then people were honking because who are these two people walking on the side of the road going coming back with Walmart bags. So these are things that everybody does not go through. But I think we need to also understand that these simple routines in life that we have can lead to stress, can lead to anxiety. And so the question is, uh, what are we going to do about it? So at that time, quote, quote, unquote, I was young. So I could kind of manage it because I ignored it. And it didn't last too long because then we move on to other phases of our life. But if you go back and think about those things and say, what would be a better way for me to handle it? It would be great to know that there was some kind of a, a stress reliever at that point in time I could have used. Come back and instead of fretting over it, you know, take a deep breath. Let's watch. Let's listen to some music. Let's listen to some meditative music. Things like that. If if I think if people are told about these tools that exist, I think it's, it'll be really helpful for everyone to deal with this as, quote, unquote, as just like any other disease. I, and you, something else that that you just may come to mind is we spend so much time covering up things like anxiety and, and stress and different things that we're feeling. Um, there's, there's a part of the poem where you talk about doldrums, mm -hmm. you know. When in actuality, everybody has those seasons. You know, life is filled, it ebbs and flows. Absolutely. And so life is filled with those moments for everybody. You know, for example, when you get hurt, like when you when you fall down and scrape yourself. I mean, you put a bandage and you're okay showing to the world that I fell down and I got cut. I mean, and we have normalized that. But we have not normalized anxiety. That's true. And that's the truth. So somebody is asking the question, what was the moment in your life that you realized that you were leveraging your obsession with with acceptance? And was this moment related to a specific event? It's interesting that you pointed it out because um, you feel helpless in certain situations because we all have certain jobs, tasks to do as adults, parents, working in a work environment, these are things that are expected by society for us to deliver on. Um, but I think the my biggest aha moment was trying to have a space where I say, I have got freedom from all these things for the for the one hour during the day. For the two hours during the day, whatever the time may be. I think it didn't come early in my life. It came probably in even past my midlife. So the question is, how do we find that? And the earlier we find it, the better it is. Even though earlier in our life, we have more things to take care of, more responsibilities than we have once the children are gone from home. It's easy to find time, all that. But I think the quicker we find it and we work on it, the more we see that this is something that we can address on our own. So for me personally, it came after 50. <laughs> because that's when I thought, really, I mean, yeah. at this point, I can find my space. And there's some people that go their entire lives yeah. and don't reconcile. Yeah. 
Yes, and, and and why is that? If you if you really think about it, again, um, you know, there's always this tendency of how much is enough? How much is enough support? How much is enough money? How much is enough in terms of materialistic need? Society does not put a line there and saying, this is enough. No, we don't have that, right? So the more we get, the more we want them. And it's a, it's a cyclical thing. So I think it's important to realize that once we are happy at a point with what we got and we feel, you know what? I really don't want more at this point. I have enough. I'm happy. My partner is happy. I'm finding everyone around me happy. I think that should be it. And that is a point where you realize that it is in your nature to be happy by just being yourself on, on your own, own time. time. This poem takes us through like the entire process. And I really appreciate the fact that in the end, the anxiety is resolved. Tell us about that about your decision because all poetry doesn't allow that a lot of times poetry is written about this particular state and we isolate that state that moment and then we write all about it and we dig deep into to that state but this poem moves and it takes us on a journey through anxiety understanding it how it impacts us how we impact it being time, which we don't, <laughs> and then taking us all the way to the point of realization. Tell us about what made you have that decision to go that route. So I really do not write a poem until I feel that my journey on the topic I'm writing on is completed. And what that means is I would not like to leave the reader at the end of the poem where they feel more anxious for this poem than when they started with. For example, if I ended with the, take out the last paragraph, we ended with paragraph prior to that, which says, it took me, took me twisting and exhausted to a new state of misery, and I stopped right there. That would kind of indicate that, oops, so what happened to this person after he wrote this poem? Uh, so it, it's, it has a kind of a negative connotation. So instead of that, I wait until my experience is kind of wholesome as far as I'm concerned. Of course, that may not be what it's for someone else, but end with a level of positivity because I feel that's the root cause of why we have issues today. It's because we always look at the negative and end with a negative. So let's end on a positive note. And that's when I actually write the poem. If I don't have a positive ending, I generally avoid writing that on that topic. How gracious and conscientious of you <laughs> to think of the the reader in that way, because a lot of times you know poetry is written to to convey a certain message to um, you know to share a story, a journey, but not necessarily thinking about how are my words impacting the reader, wow. and when they leave my poetry. I want them to leave in a better state than they were in when they came. Correct. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. I thank you so very much for your time with us thank today. You, Let's sir. give the a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. So, if anybody's wanting to follow you, get in touch with you, how can they connect with sure. you? Sure. Um, just send an email to me at n p a t r i n patry sixty seven at gmail dot com, and I would be glad to answer any of the questions you have or um, any any kind of topics you'd like me to talk with you on. Bring it on. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank Lange. you. Appreciate it. Thanks to the Lanjan for sharing his poem and for talking with us as we unwrap the meaning and the muse behind his poem, My Time Box. The inspired topic from his poem is something that we can all relate to and something that we've probably felt at one time or another, and that is anxiety. And personally, I didn't really hear that term much as a medical diagnosis until after the pandemic. So it makes you wonder, is this like the new buzzword? Is it a new condition? Is it something that really took off as a result of the pandemic? Well, stay tuned because we are about to talk about it with our special guest.
As we shift from discussing the art of poetry to navigating encounters with anxiety, we are joined by a mental health professional, and it is important to note that the information shared is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease or medical condition. You are encouraged to consult with your own healthcare provider or mental health professional regarding any specific questions or concerns that you may have regarding your health and your well-being. Now, with that being said, stay tuned as we get a better understanding of anxiety and the role that it plays in each of our lives. Jamelia Knox is a master level marriage and family therapist. She received a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from Austin Peay State University in 2015. And in 2018, she graduated from Lee University with a Master of Science in Marriage and Family Therapy. Jamelia has over seven years of experience in the mental health field, including five years of conducting therapy with individuals, families, and couples. She currently works works full-time as a counselor at an inpatient psychiatric facility while also carrying a small caseload in the evenings with a group private practice. She joined the mental health field with goals of helping people to have a healthier and a more satisfying life as an individual and within their relationships. While she has found her passion in mental health, she also loves traveling, trying new experiences, and spending time with her family and friends. Join me in welcoming our guest, Ms. Jamelia Knox. Hello, oh, Jamelia. Yeah. Welcome Thank to One Rhyme at a Time. We are honored to have you join us in this discussion on anxiety. Yes. So, we just had a talk with the poet, Nalanjan. He shared with us his poem, My Time Box. And there is a very strong connection between the poetry that he shared and the topic of anxiety. We want you to shed some light on it for us. So what exactly is anxiety? So anxiety at its most basic level is an emotion. Um, we all experience different levels of anxiety at various times. And kind of to like explain it, it's really like worry, nervousness, and like stress, like all wrapped into one. Um, and it's like the the fear of a perceived danger. So not that there's necessarily is a danger, but there is just the thought that there could be a danger. And then because of those thoughts, we actually have like a physical reaction. Yeah. Yeah. A lot, a lot of physical <laughs> reactions. So what does that even look like? What does yeah. that look like? One of the more common ones is like increased heart rate. A lot of people experience like their heartbeat would pick up. Sometimes they'll, you know, express it in such a way like I feel like my heart's about to jump out my chest. Um Rapid thoughts, um, like the overthinking type of thoughts, spiraling, so going from like, what if, like, what if this happens, and then what if that happens, those type of thoughts, um, sweating, becoming hot, fidgeting is another big one, um, people fidget things in our hands, and that other one we see like bouncing legs, like yes, indicators of anxiety, um, yeah, there's just, there's so many different indicators, um, so people become tearful when they're anxious, or even get to the point where they're at a panic attack. Um, which is like extreme anxiety, essentially. So it manifests just oh, differently yeah. in different people, mm -hmm. and then also depending on the situation that we're faced with. Yeah. So is anxiety something like it, as we're like listening to the the things that you're mentioning and the the ways that it physically manifests, and it's like, oh, that happens with me. Oh, that happens with me. That when is it? to a point to where we need to go and talk to somebody. Yeah. So anxiety is great for therapy. Like it's therapy is an excellent tool for working with anxiety, getting it under control, really gaining that insight into like triggers, my warning signs. How do I know I'm becoming anxious? How do I actually respond? How do I calm down? And so that building that insight is, is very helpful. Um, and so at any levels of anxiety, therapy is a great option. I'm a big supporter of like always having a therapist or having somebody to talk to, even when things are going well in your life. Mm -hmm. Just like how we have a primary care physician when we're healthy 
you know, and we go in for our annual checkups and things of that nature. I'm one that feels like, you know, we need to have a life coach or, you know, somebody that we can just really, really be um, transparent and Mm -hmm. vulnerable with. Yeah. Um, and and I I can see that truly being um helpful to somebody who is dealing with those feelings of, of anxiousness and anxiety. Yeah. So if we find ourselves in a situation where we realize that our, our heart rate is increasing and, and we feel the sweatiness of the palms, what are some things that in that moment that we can do yeah. to bring some calmness to ourselves? Sure. We typically call those coping skills. And so that just kind of like helps us to get through the moment. Um, for anxiety specifically, deep breathing is a very helpful tool because a lot of times if you notice you're Anxiety comes with like a shortness of breath sometimes. And so our breathing usually changes. Um, we're maybe breathing a lot faster, taking more shallow breaths. So just really try to like slow your breath down, get some oxygen back to your brain and circulating through your body. Um, there's so many different breathing techniques out there. There's one I heard of and I teach sometimes. Um, of course, you do it based off however your body can handle it. Like if you have heart issues, lung issues, something, you, you may want to modify it. But it's like box breathing where you breathe in for four, you hold it for four, you breathe out for four, you hold it for four, and you just keep in that cycle. And it's it's really healthy to just practice deep breathing periodically and not just when you're anxious, but definitely when you're anxious. Um, grounding techniques are another one, just kind of, and mindfulness. Um, mindfulness helps you get back into the here and now. And so when we have anxiety, typically our thoughts are on the past or the future, but not likely what's happening in the present moment. Um, So like it's thoughts of the past of like, um, I can't believe I said that. Like, why did I do that? I should have handled that better. Or we're thinking about the future. Uh, I have this big presentation at work. I have this big exam looking forward to. I'm not looking forward to. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so the mindfulness helps bring you back into the here and now. And so just trying to like be in tune with your body. Like what type of, what, how's my body responding right now? What is actually happening? Do I feel the AC? Do I feel heat? Do I feel my toes in my shoes? Like just trying to bring your attention back to the here and now. When you say mindfulness, that means like intentionally thinking about the the spot where you stay like mm-hmm. what's physically and what is it what does that do for you so like when we're in that anxious thought or we're spiraling we're kind of like detached from reality in those moments it's kind of like we're so lost in those thoughts that we kind of just we lose track of what's happening around us um like this is a pretty popular example maybe not necessarily anxiety but like um, sometimes when people are driving they tend to like zone out and then they'll get to their destination and it's like I don't remember seeing this. Like, you know, I didn't like, yes. Yes. <laughs> it's so common, but in those moments, like they're obviously not practicing mindfulness. They're just kind of like zoned out in their thoughts, or maybe they just go blank and they're just, you know, mindlessly driving, but they're not bringing attention into like what's actually happening in those moments. So it's just kind of like bringing your attention back to the present moment. And I guess the the more present we are in the present moment, the less ability we have to drift off into those areas that would bring on yeah. anxiety, yeah. like thinking about, you know, the, the mistake that we made yeah. or the mistake that we're going to make. <laughs> <laughs> we're just scared we're going to make. We don't know if we're going to make it or not. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> we didn't give ourselves a chance to make the mistake or not. That's true. That's true. Well, but not giving ourselves grace. Yeah. Not giving ourselves grace. And there was another term that you mentioned. You said something about grounding. Mm-hmm. Now, is that the same as mindfulness or is that something different? Mindfulness is a part of grounding techniques. Like grounding techniques is like the overarching and then mindfulness is like one of the ways you can practice grounding. And so like another way that I like to teach my clients, um, and I can't take credit for these either, but <laughs> it uses all five of your senses. Um so I think we just call it the five, four, three, two, one. And so you just bring to help bring yourself back into attention of what's happening around you. So you just um, identify five things that you physically can see, um, four things that you physically can feel. It's so like I feel my toes in my shoes or I can feel my hair, or, you know, um, three things that you hear. And it's like as you go through it, it kind of really have to like focus in a little bit. Um, Because a lot of times we blank out some of those sounds and we just get used to it. Um, Two things that you can smell. 
Because sometimes I like encourage my clients, like, can you still smell your shampoo, your deodorant, your perfume? Because those are scents that after so long, we don't even notice it anymore. And then one thing that you can taste, and it just kind of helps bring yourself back into the here and now. Yeah, and it's, it's kind of like a, a distraction. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> pulling yeah. ourselves in. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the things that you said, there's several things that you said oh. that are like really, really interesting. But one of the things that you said at the very beginning that was interesting was when you referred to anxiety as an emotion. Mm-hmm. Because when I think of anxiety, I, I kind of put anxiety, and I'm not, I don't have a medical background at all, but I think about anxiety and it's right there with stress. And I don't consider stress an emotion and depression. And I don't think of depression as an emotion. Like in my in my head, I think of those things as like diagnoses, like, mm-hmm. like that's a diagnosis. And so maybe that's not the case. So so how what actually is the way that we should honestly view um anxiety? Yeah. I would encourage you to view it as an emotion because emotions are normal. We experience these things. Anxiety is normal. We all experience some levels of anxiety at some point in life. And I know you mentioned it earlier that, like, it's one of those things that I, I can say for myself and probably most of us is that we maybe didn't grow up with that term anxiety. But sometimes when we look back, we can say, like, oh, now that I know what this word is, I was definitely anxious. I wasn't just making up, you know, being crazy or being silly or being, you know, obnoxious. I was dealing with some forms of anxiety. And I think normalizing it, that it's just an emotion and that it's not that you have to be on medication if you experience anxiety or that you can't do certain things. It's just, hey, you're experiencing this emotion. It's uncomfortable. It's difficult to deal with sometimes, but you can push through it just like any other emotion. You can feel it. You can, you know, resolve it and and keep moving. I think that is really, really powerful and very a really healthy way to to look at it and also to realize that when we experience those feelings mm-hmm. that we we have control yeah. like we we have control over those things like within myself I have the tools that I need in order to overcome this mm-hmm. as compared to I'm feeling this feeling and it's going to control me and run me and it's going to run the rest of my day. And, you know, yeah, and I've yeah. got to go and get some medicine or I've got to go and, and self-medicate in mm-hmm. some other mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. harmful way to, to numb whatever this is that I have the ability to change what's happening. Yes. In my body. And that's such a powerful move, too, because anxiety can feel so intense sometimes. Like, if we have a small level of anxiety, we can just maybe shake it off. But sometimes when it's, like, super intense, it feels like we don't have control over our life. It feels like I can't do this. And sometimes that's what's happening in our self-talk, that we're just like, this is too much. I can't do this. I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough. And so pushing through that gives you that control of your life. Like, I'm experiencing this emotion. It's uncomfortable. But there's nothing I can't do. Like, <laughs> I can do the hard things. I can do the easy thing. I can do it all. And so it just really gives you, gives that person back control of their life to you. Change that self-talk and to realize how, like, anxiety actually does not control my life. I control anxiety. I tell it when to go away. I love that. I love that. So, so you mentioned self-talk. <laughs> what's the correlation between anxiety and what's happening with your self-talk yeah yeah it's a huge correlation because <laughs> anxiety basically it starts in our thoughts and then you know manifests in our body and we, we have those physical reactions but it definitely starts in our thoughts and sometimes it it can feel debil- debilitating to where we you know we feed into it we don't know any better if we don't know that i have power i have control we do feed into it and we're just like oh i you know we start to put ourselves down unfortunately and one thing that I do with my clients especially is just trying to help rebuild the self and helping my clients understand that they do have power, that they do have a say-so, that they do have control of their life and really emphasize working on their self-talk. My clients probably get tired of me, but I preach all day long affirmations. Like, <laughs> I think it is so powerful to be able to speak to ourselves in a kind way, in an uplifting way, in an encouraging way. And not that we just get a superpower, but we start to believe in ourselves and we start to think that we have more strength than, well, we have a lot of strength, but we start to like tap into that strength that we actually have. And we take away the strength from anxiety and doing that. And we just, you know, build ourselves up. But yeah, that negative self-talk is 
It's a strong correlation, unfortunately. So what are the so for some <clears throat> who aren't familiar with affirmations, mm-hmm. what that means, yeah. how to do that. Because if we're stuck in a <clears throat> mindset, if we're stuck in a mindset, a mind frame of going down this negative, yeah. you know, here I go again, and I'm doing the same stuff, and man, I'm so stupid, and mm-hmm. I'm never going to, you know, be a success. And I'm if, they, if we're accustomed to doing that, we don't necessarily know how to not do that. So how do you get to the point to where you're actually affirming yourself? Mm-hmm. Yeah, probably in to start, maybe just even realizing what your self-talk is like. It happens so frequently that a lot of times we're just not even aware until we build that level of insight. And there's a term in psychology called the self-fulfilling prophecy. And so essentially what that is, is kind of the belief that we become what we believe or what others believe of us. And so if somebody is constantly telling you, like, Jamelia, you are a dumb person, you're never going to achieve, I'm probably going to have a much harder time achieving. It's not that I can't, but I don't have that belief in myself or I don't have the support of other people believe me. And I start to believe that after a while. But if I also, on the contrary, if I have somebody, you know, speaking life into me and saying, like, Jamelia, you're going to do amazing things, like, don't ever give up, like, keep pushing, like, you have all this strength inside of you, I'm more likely to achieve or more likely to put in efforts to try to achieve. And so we have that self-talk. We have that same effect talking to ourselves. So if I tell myself, like, this is too hard, I just need to quit, I'm never, you know, I'll never be as good as so-and-so. And I may not ever be as good as so-and-so, but that doesn't mean I don't need to try and I don't need, or I don't have what it takes to be good. And so we do have to speak life into ourselves. And and when we believe in ourselves, we believe we have the strength and this capability to do things. We are more likely to do those things. Right. I, so I even, I even think about, there was a show, I think it was Being Mary Jane, where she had like sticky notes mm-hmm. on like her bathroom mm-hmm. mirror with affirmations mm-hmm. and things like that. <clears throat> um, are there any other um, like tricks or or things that we can just kind of do to surround ourselves by positivity and to remind ourselves the importance yeah. of, you know, thinking well and speaking well yeah. about ourselves. I think definitely those reminders, like put it on your mirror, you see your mirror every day, put it as like an alert on your phone, like um, put it in a calendar where it'll... Every Thursday, you have this affirmation read to you. There's apps, actually. Um, one of my friends was telling me about an app that'll send you reminders throughout the, or affirmations throughout the day. Um, if possible, realizing what your negative self-talk is and then finding the opposite of that. So if my negative self-talk is telling me that I'm not smart enough, even if I don't believe it, affirming myself that I am smart enough and really like combating those type of negative thoughts like head on. Because sometimes we do those affirmations like, I'm beautiful. I'm important. And we maybe already know those things. And it's like, yeah, it's good. Remind yourself of those things. That's great. But is that really helping the actual problem that you're dealing with? That is, that's, that's a very, that's a very good point. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you something that I um, have done for myself. I leave myself voice messages. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so I will call myself, especially if there's like a big project that mm-hmm. I've been working on, um, sometimes in my personal life, sometimes in my actual job. I will call like from my work phone, I will call my cell phone yeah. and I will leave myself a message saying, Marsha, you did such a great job. Yeah, I'm going to start hearing that. that. <laughs> I will leave myself messages. Yeah, that is so sweet. <laughs> I do. So I think, I think it is like to just be intentional yeah. to be kind and, mm-hmm. and gracious to ourselves mm-hmm. can help not only um, preventing anxiety or dealing with anxiety when it comes because it is a natural emotion. Yeah. Um, but also, like, that speaks to, to depression. It speaks mm-hmm. to other things as well, as long as we are intentional. I, I find myself, and I can't speak for other people, but I find myself being a much better encourager of others than I am of myself. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, you can do it. Oh, you're capable. Oh, you're so powerful. And oh, you're, you know. Mm-hmm. And then when it comes to myself, I don't always do that for myself. Yeah. So so being intentional yeah. does a lot. Absolutely. I, I agree. Like putting, yeah, the intentionality and just trying to love on yourself just as much as you love on other people. I think that's so important to, to do those that. things. One thing that came to mind is in my own personal journey when I realized like, hey, I have anxiety. 
I had the thoughts of like, am I losing my mind? Like, am I going crazy? So I actually wrote a little poem to myself and it, I didn't believe it at the time because I was just so, I guess, depleted from the anxiety. But I wrote a little poem to myself and just saying, you know, just acknowledge like, hey, I'm dealing with anxiety. It's okay. Like, I'm still strong. I'm still smart. I'm still, you know, all these things. And that really helped me. So every time I noticed myself starting to get like, really anxious or notice my self-esteem like dropping i would just read read myself that affirmation i wrote nice yeah nice 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 that would be the type of thing that i would probably make copies of and have one in my car mm-hmm. and have one on my desk <laughs> at work and have one stuck to my refrigerator on my mirror All the reminders. Um, because because you know, just going through life, it's challenging. Yeah. And and people aren't always kind. Mm-hmm. And situations are not always fair. Mm-hmm. And we do need to put forth um, a concerted effort. It's self-care to, you know, prepare ourselves and, and kind of have some balance yeah. as well. Yeah. I think back to um, part of what Nalanjan was saying when he was talking about um, just the things that he enjoys doing outside of his work. And he was talking about playing badminton and, mm-hmm. you know, exercising mm-hmm. and writing. So those are, that, that helps live a balanced yeah. life. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. So what, what's the importance of, um, <clears throat> when it comes to balance in one's life, work, home, extremely important (laughs) you do not want to put all your attention into one thing you want to try to and it's so important to make time for yourself that's one of the first things people let go of they're just like well i can just sacrifice that you know maybe make time next week but it's so important to make time for yourself to make sure you know that you're important and that you are taking care of yourself the way you take care of other people and just love on yourself like it's so that needs to be incorporated in that work-life balance, work-life me balance. Like, <laughs> it's so, so, so important. I, I believe the, in the importance of normalizing self-care. Mm-hmm. For some reason in my mind, when I was coming up, and I don't know what it was mm-hmm. about it, but when people will like set aside a certain amount of time to, you know, get their nails done or get a massage or that that was like, it's like, that's just kind of selfish. Like they're just being, you know, self-absorbed or, you know, they're, it was viewed as a negative yeah. in some, in some aspects because they were taking care of themselves. Yeah. And, and that's another um, stigma that we need to mm-hmm. get away from and not feeling guilty. Yeah about caring for yourself, not feeling guilty about setting some time aside, even, you know, if you have children, setting some time, you know, to where, you know, I need some time alone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I agree. And I think that's so very, very important. Time is, it's, it's very precious. And we always say we don't have time because there's so many things taking our attention, but being intentional about setting that time aside. This is my me time. Don't interrupt. And it don't have to be like, you have to do a whole day, 24 hours of just me time. But even if you take like 20 minutes to do something that doesn't add stress to your life, that is a level of self-care. Read a chapter of your favorite book, you know, dance in the mirror, listen to your favorite song or repeat whatever. Just something that is for you and that makes you happy or that doesn't add stress to your life. Very valuable. Absolutely. So thank you so much for being here with us. For those who want to get in touch with you, how can they connect? Um, so two ways that are probably good. Um, Instagram. Uh, my page is a Jamelia moment uh, or at a Jamelia moment. So A-J-A-M-E-L-I-A-M-O-M-E-N-T. Um, or through email, Jamelia not at Gmail. J-A-M-E-L-I-A-K-N-O-X at gmail.com. You have been a joy. Thank, oh, thank you so you. very much for being with me. <laughs> Just thank you for having me. Thank you so much. <laughs> As we conclude another episode of One Rhyme at a Time, I want to thank our featured poet, Nalanjan, and our guest mental health professional, Jamelia, our studio audience, and of course you, for joining us in this conversation. You know, anxiety is a natural feeling that can impact us in a myriad of ways. Journaling, writing, and creating are all great ways to help us identify what triggers us and 
It can help us get a better understanding of how feelings of anxiousness show up in our lives and the process that helps us return back to balance. We would like to hear from you. What makes you anxious and how do you navigate in those moments? Tell us about it in your own original poem that you've written in response to this podcast. Submit your poem to rncpoetry at gmail.com for the chance to have your poem read on an upcoming episode. We hope that our discussions on poetry and its healing aspects inspire you to write more, to read more, and to seek out opportunities to immerse yourself in creative processes. Until next time, this is The Poetic Diva. May your days be filled with inspiration, healing, and poetry, one rhyme at a time.